Uh, Dr. Martin received her BA in physics from Wheaton College in 2006, her MS from Northwestern University in Earth and Planetary Science in 2009, and her PhD in ge Geological Sciences uh, from the University of Idaho in 2014. This is her first time speaking at an SSEP conference, so let's give Dr. Martin a warm welcome. So I have my phone here, and I promise I'm not checking my text messages. I just want to make sure I keep you all on time. So I'm really excited to be here today, and I had a really good time putting this presentation together for you all because I spend most of my time in the outer solar system, but a lot of the planetary missions and the exploration that's going on a little bit closer to home is also really exciting to me. Um, and it's really fun to get to kind of geek out about all the different mission architectures that they've been putting together with NASA um, and in collaboration with ESA. Um, and even some of the um, international collaborations that have been going on. So I want to start with, I promise I'm going to make it hopefully as entertaining as possible, um, how you know what kind of mission to put together. How do you know where to propose to go? It's not as straightforward. I'm going to talk really briefly about this super boring sounding thing called the Decadal Survey. It's kind of boring but traumatic. It's like 400 pages long. Um, and then I want to kind of do a quick overview of what we've got going on in the solar system right now and what you might be able to look forward to. <laughs> So getting involved in planetary science, specifically faults and fractures, specifically of the moons of Saturn, is kind of a narrow field. And I'm often asked, how did that happen? Um, I'm not somebody who ever really thought about doing science as I was growing up. I wasn't a kid who was particularly passionate at any STEM field. Um, STEM wasn't a thing when I was a kid. So um, this is a relatively new thing. So in 2004, when I started thinking about planetary missions, I was working as an intern at a planetarium back in New Hampshire. And the Cassini mission to the Saturn system was arriving. And I remember they had NASA TV kind of up on the big monitors in the um, sort of main foyer area. And I remember seeing an image very similar to this, which is a close-up image of Saturn's rings from the Cassini mission really early on in the mission. And you can actually see on this big white ring kind of on the inside, do you see that it's not smooth? It's kind of, kind of waves a little bit. That's a real thing. So I saw that and it kind of blew my mind a little bit in terms of how dynamic the Saturn system was um, and how interesting this mission might be. So this, this was a moment in my history where the Cassini mission really kind of got on my radar. Um, and that's the Cassini spacecraft. There's a person if you squint at the bottom there for scale. So really enormous spacecraft. Um, when I was in college though, my professor brought this journal article into class one day. He wanted to kind of start off class with this particular um, issue because he was really excited about icy satellites in the outer solar system, which is naturally what got me involved in it. And he brought this issue in. Now, when you probably don't look too, at too many pictures of planetary surfaces, but the, the sort of rule of thumb is if you ever see a planetary surface that doesn't have a lot of craters in it, it turns out that it's really young. And if you look at this image, you'll see kind of at the bottom part of this moon, this is Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, um, you'll notice these kind of bluish looking cracks right at the bottom there. Those are called the tiger stripes. That's in the south pole of Enceladus. And I looked at that and I said, gosh, there's no craters there. These moons are supposed to be boring and old and not very interesting, and there can't be much going on there, so what the heck is that? And then he flipped open, and he flipped open to this page that had this figure on it, and I said, gosh, that's the south pole of this tiny moon Enceladus, which is about the size of Washington State, and there's some stuff shooting out at the bottom of it. Well, that's really weird. That couldn't possibly be what it looks like. And to me, what it looked like was a bunch of water shooting out of the bottom of this tiny little moon. And what it turns out to be is water shooting out of the bottom of this little tiny moon. That shouldn't happen. They're not dynamically, like this isn't possible. So this kind of put me on the road to continuing to explore planetary bodies and planetary surfaces. Um, I was a senior in college at that point. So I'm coming to this really late. I wasn't dreaming about doing this my entire life and I'm still trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. But so far I've been kind of stumbling through one door after another. Um, and I've been really fortunate to get to continue to study places like Enceladus, which are just, they're mind boggling. I mean, look at that thing, Washington State, still warm, got liquid in there, it's really exciting. So that's led me on this path of being able to study and continuing to study most of the things that we like to call not planets. So I haven't spent any time studying Mars or Venus or Mercury, although they're very interesting in their own right. 
But Emily Lachtwell of the Planetary Society put together this really cool infographic that I always really love to show during presentations because it shows you mostly satellites. Um, we've got some dwarf planets in there, Pluto and Ceres, and some of these other really interesting asteroids like Vesta. But most of these bodies, save maybe our moon and Io, are made predominantly out of water ice, um, maybe with some rocky cores. And so I've spent most of my time focusing on these places. Although recently I've been spending some time studying our moon, which got me to thinking, A, I really wanted to spend some time last night digging through Apollo imagery, so I use this as a good excuse. And B, it got me thinking about how our moon is actually really special because it's the only place where we've ever sent people to go explore the surface. Most of the other surfaces we've explored, all the other surfaces we've explored have been robotically. And those robots have done an unbelievable job for us. But still to date, some of the most fundamental data that we use in planetary science comes from the samples and the data returned by the Apollo's, Apollo missions. Um, so because we're celebrating, sorry, that's another one. Because we're celebrating the anniversary of Apollo 11, the first lunar landing, I dug up this map because not only was it a technological and sort of engineering achievement, they did a lot of science on the surface of the moon. And when you think about total between Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, we're talking about four and a half hours on the surface of the moon. They deployed like, I don't know, like seven experiments and collected like 40 pounds of rocks. I mean, they did an enormous amount of work in a very short period of time. Um, and if you see the little sort of diamond shape, that's the lunar module. And this is kind of a rough sketch map of where they dropped their instruments. Um, and then Double and Little West are the craters kind of where they landed in between. And I thought this was a really cool way to sort of jumpstart our exploration into what's going on right now in the solar system and how it's being explored kind of from this point on. So I'm gonna start off a little bit with kind of getting into the not too nitty gritty um, overview of what kinds of missions NASA flies. And I'm going to stick primarily to the missions that NASA is doing, although NASA is involved in a lot of really active collaborations with the European Space Agency um, and a variety of other international partners. There's a lot of ways to get NASA to fund a mission to go somewhere interesting with a robot. We're going to focus on planetary exploration exclusively. Um, and for the most part, we're going to talk about these three programs, the Discovery Program, New Frontiers, and um, it's called solar system exploration, but we like to call it flagship for the most part, which we also know as small, medium, and large. And really what the difference is between small, medium, large is not so much the size of the spacecraft, but the size of the budget. So when we talk about the discovery mission, the small mission, we're talking about $500 million. New Frontiers, we're talking about a billion dollars. And large or flagship class missions, we're talking about more than that. Somewhere between, you know, more than a billion and a lot more than a billion. So how do you know what to put in the proposals to these missions? Not all of these missions get funded through proposals, but let's just assume they all do. How do you know what to propose and where? So this is, I promise I'm gonna go through this part fast. So there's this document that gets written every 10 years called, wait for it, the Decadal Survey, because it's every 10 years. So the current Decadal Survey is Vision and Voyages. Um, it goes from 2013 to 2022. So we are in the process of starting to think about what's gonna go in the next Decadal Survey because it's like 400 pages long and you don't do it in like a month. You do it like, takes a couple of years. So this is a document that's produced by the National Research Council for agencies like NASA. Um, but what's really cool about it is that it's a community document People in the planetary science community, specifically for the planetary science decadal, they work on writing papers about what they think is the most important part um, of the future of the science within our community. And they take that and they collate it into this document so that when NASA gets their budget in any given year, they can go back to the decadal survey and they can say, what did the community say was the most important thing for us to do right now? And so they can go back to that and say, gosh, we at least know what the community thinks is really important. Now let's think about where we think we should direct them to go. So what they do is every once in a while they put out a call or an announcement of opportunity for something like, say, a New Frontiers mission. These New Frontier missions have already sort of been talked about within the community for that decadal survey. So what I have here is, a, it, well, the list that was in this year's decadal, it's changed a little bit, but New Frontiers, that's the medium class mission. You can see on the right here, there's a list of things like a Saturn probe or a Venus in situ explorer or going back to Io. 
And when you look at the large class missions or the flagship class missions, you can see there's far fewer. And part of the reason there's far fewer, right, is because they're a lot more expensive. So if you're going to go with a more expensive mission, you probably don't get to do as many of them. But what's really interesting about this list is the Mars Astrobiology Explorer Cacher is now called Mars 2020, and the Jupiter Europa Orbiter D-Scope, which just means it's a lot less mission than they thought it might be, um, is called the Europa Clipper mission now. Um, and I'll go over some of those missions a little bit more. But this gives me the perfect opportunity to geek out a little bit about the latest New Frontiers call. Did anybody hear about this in the news last week? One, really? You guys are killing me. Hey, there it is. I knew we had some people. So the Dragonfly mission is the latest New Frontiers mission to be selected. And this is a long process, right? So they put together a proposal with like, I don't know, 12, maybe 20 other groups. Those got down selected by NASA to five. Those five got down selected to two. And those two got down selected to one. And that took like three and a half years. It's fine. So we're going to Titan. Dragonfly is a particularly interesting mission, though. We're not orbiting Titan. We're going to land on it with an octocopter. We haven't done this anywhere. The reason this is so possible, and this thing's maybe the size of, I, I actually haven't seen a full-scale model of it, but it's, like, it's kind of like, I think it's like this. It might be a little bit bigger. It's huge. So it's this octocopter that's got this suite of instruments that's going to do a lot of really exciting geochemistry on the surface of Titan. But what's extra cool, is because Titan has such a thick atmosphere, an atmosphere thicker than we have here on Earth, it actually makes this so much easier to do than it would be on Earth or on Mars, a place with a really thin atmosphere, or even a place like Triton, Neptune's moon, has a really thin atmosphere. So this mission architecture is really doable in a place like Titan. We haven't done this before. So everybody's really excited about this technology because we never have this opportunity on an icy satellite. What makes Titan cool is not only this really thick atmosphere, so you can't, this is a picture of Titan here on the left. Yeah, that's the left. Um, and you can see this haze. That's not something you can orbit with a regular camera and just image the surface of. You have to use different wavelengths of light. So we've only seen the surface of Titan from mostly radar. And one image, this image here, in both black and white and then um, a false color version of it, um, this image was taken by the European Space Agency's Huygens probe, which was on the side of Cassini. Um, and that's all we've got. I mean, that's less than what we have for Venus from the Russian landers. So Titan's a really interesting thing. And if you're ever taken geology, you'll know anytime you see a rock that doesn't look like it's just been whacked with a hammer, you see a rock that's kind of roundish like that, it means that it's been like tumbled around and moved around, maybe by liquid, maybe by wind. Um, but that's really interesting and something you wouldn't expect on this distant moon of Saturn. The other thing you certainly wouldn't expect, and these are images that have been taken in radar because of that thick atmosphere, you have dunes in the equator, and you have active coastlines around liquid lakes. They are lakes of liquid methane ethane. So it turns out that Titan has this hydrological cycle that's currently active on the surface, but instead of hydro water, we have liquid methane ethane. I mean, Titan's just ridiculous. So if you didn't know any better, you might say that those are pictures of Earth. But what's even more interesting about Titan is that it has seasonal changes. So most of the lakes that we see are in the northern regions of Titan. Um, but because Cassini went for 13 years and Titan was one of the big motivators, they continue to take pictures of the same place on the surface. Again, these are radar, but you can actually see what they call the magic island or the disappearing island. But you can actually see that the lake levels change with the seasons. So we have an incredibly geologically active body in the solar system. It's not even a planet, it's a moon. But what's so exciting about that is there's very few places in the solar system that are geologically active. And there's a liquid water ocean, you have all these hydrocarbons, and so in terms of looking for life and thinking about habitable environments, Titan is a perfect place to go. So that's something you guys can all look forward to. I think, what did I, oh, oh, I tried to go backwards. I shouldn't try and go backwards. Did I have? Oh, I didn't do it. No, we're good. Um, I was going to say, I think it's scheduled to launch sometime in the late 2020s with an arrival in 2034, I believe. Um, we'll have to fact check that. But I thought I had it written down on the bottom of the slide, and I didn't do that. But we're talking kind of, it's a, it's, it's a long cruise, because this is a big spacecraft. Um, but it's, it's just going to be the best. You guys are going to be excited. I'm excited. 
So I want to talk a little bit in my remaining time, because I am running out of it quickly, um, and my stopwatch canceled on me. There it is. OK, so what's up? Has everybody heard of Insight? Landed on Mars. Yeah, we got one person heard of Insight. Yeah. Landed on Mars. It's got a seismometer. And the point is to try and figure out what the interior structure of Mars is like. Specifically, is it still hard? Is it hard boiled or soft boiled? Is it still molten on the inside or not? We actually don't know that. We know that about our Earth. We don't know that about Mars. Juno, amazing images coming back from Juno, studying the chemistry and the atmosphere dynamics of Jupiter, which is really cool. LRO just celebrated its 10 year anniversary of going around the moon. There it is. That's not, that's not the slide I wanted. All right, well, what you would have seen in the previous slide, but apparently it's not there, um, is a bunch of other active missions that are going on, like the Mars Science Lab that's roving around the surface of Mars. Um, what else was on there? Well, we can look it up later. But the point is there's an incredible amount of spacecraft that are still going on. New Horizons just did its Ultima Thule flyby on New Year's Eve, and it's still going out into the Kuiper Belt, and we don't know what it's going to do next. Um, there's a lot of really intriguing spacecraft that are still going around. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is even older than the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it's still providing infrastructure for the rovers on the surface of Mars, because those rovers don't communicate directly by, with Earth. So there's a lot of missions that are still ongoing um, that are really been foundational and fundamental to what's going on. And LRO in particular is a really interesting mission because that's still going, and it may help provide us some of the infrastructure we need for maybe putting humans back on the moon, uh, back on the moon in 2024. So coming up, we have to look forward to Mars 2020. That's one of the large class missions that was um, pointed out in this year's decadal survey, visions in this decade's decadal survey. Um, so Mars 2020 is going to launch sometime next summer. Um, and it's a really short cruise. It'll arrive sometime in 2021. And what's really cool about this mission is that it's a um, stage one of three to cache samples or collect samples, put them in a container, leave them on the surface of Mars, Stage two will go pick up those canisters, and stage three, three will bring those home. So this is very similar to the Mars Science Lab. It's on the same chassis, um, but they've included some additional instrumentation in order to do this next level of Mars science, which is sample return. I'm really excited about uh, Europa Clipper. Um, this is another one of the large class missions. It's going to go to Jupiter's moon. Um, right now, it's scheduled to launch in 2023, but we don't know when it's going to get there yet because we don't know how big the rocket's going to be yet. Once we know how big the rocket's going to be, we know what its trajectory is going to be, and then we know how long it's going to take to get there. So that's still TBD. But what's really exciting about this mission, not only is it an icy satellite, so it's near and dear to my heart, um, we think Europa is one of the ocean worlds that we've been talking about, or you maybe have been hearing a little bit about in the news. But they're really interesting because they've got these liquid water oceans underneath these icy crusts. So all the geology you see is happening in ice, and it's overlaying on this body of liquid water, um, and then you have a rocky core. So there's some really interesting chemistry that can be going on there, and so this is something to keep your eye out for. DART is one I didn't really know a lot about, um, so I had to do a little bit of Googling for all you. But I had heard about it because I have some friends working on this mission. DART is very kind of like anti-Armageddon. We're trying to figure out how we might be able to mitigate near-Earth asteroids to protect Earth. So what's going to happen is this spacecraft, the one with the two, two big uh, solar panels, is going to hit this moonlet, which is going around this asteroid. And the idea is to hit the moonlet just enough to change its trajectory around and actually crash into its own asteroid. The idea being that if that works, we might be able to adapt that to some other kind of technology so that if we do discover something with a trajectory too close for comfort, we might be able to mitigate that. Well, the gift worked. Um, also coming up, um, the Lucy mission is going to go to the Jupiter Trojans. That's this, um, that little orange dot that's in the big blue circle. That's Jupiter, and all those green dots are what are called Trojans. They're kind of a uh, class of asteroid. Um, that we've never visited before and we don't know a ton about. We've only ever done ground-based observations. Um, but Lucy's going to go there. And then Psyche, this one's really cool. It's out of the, um, the principal investigator for Psyche. is launching in 2022, and the principal investigator is from Arizona State University. This is also an asteroid, so it's in the main asteroid belt. But what's really special about it is we think it's made out of all metal. So has anybody ever touched like an iron meteorite? You touched there, just, okay. It's really heavy. It's made out of iron. 
it looks like an iron rock. We think that what it might be, or where iron meteorites come from, is that they come from planetesimals that just never quite made it into planet status, but they started to differentiate a little bit, and they started building those iron cores. So what we think Psyche is, is a remnant core from a planet that just didn't quite get there. But it's all metal. So what does that mean, geologically speaking? What does a crater in metal look like? We don't know the answer to that. So Psyche is going to head there to go try and answer that for us, and that's a really exciting mission. So maybe what's coming up right now is um, these ice giant missions. So this was one of the things that was flagged in the Decadal Survey as being something that we really want to do. Um, we want to go visit Uranus and Neptune. Um, we don't know a lot about them. Um, Neptune is near and dear to my heart because of its large moon, Triton, which has this tenuous atmosphere and this really crazy young surface that looks like the skin of a cantaloupe melon that shouldn't be like that. So we're trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, and then New Horizons is really interesting because it's still going, still one of the fastest spacecraft ever made by humans. It did its Ultima Thule flyby, it did its Pluto flyby, we still don't know where it's going. So maybe it has enough fuel to do one more flyby if they find the right object in the right place. Um, so that's one to watch too. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip my last couple of slides, um, but I want to encourage you to kind of keep your eye out for those NASA press releases because this stuff is really exciting. There's always something launching. This is just the planetary missions. Um, there's still Earth missions and um, other kinds of solar system exploration with respect to the sun, and um, there's all kinds of really good stuff going on. So keep your eyes peeled to the news, keep your eyes peeled to the internet, um, because these are the kinds of things that get planned now, but they still need people in 5, 10, 15 years to build the spacecraft, design the spacecraft, and do the science. So um, keep your eyes out for these things, because they're going to be great. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Dr. Emily? Forgive me. Uh, my name's Steve, I'm from Florida. You were speaking about the um, the moon with the water on it. Do you call it hydro or something or something? Sure. How do you know what that's made of? Sure. Never... Sure. So I called it hydrology or hydrologically active. Um, that's Titan, Saturn's moon. I say hydro because we don't really have a better word for it. Um, it's not water. It's liquid methane ethane. And we know that in part from ground-based observations, but also from the observations that were made by spectrometers on the Cassini mission. Um, so looking at how um, the composition of the things on the surface, I don't do spectroscopy, I'm way out of my depth, essentially how that interacts with the different wavelengths of light, whether it absorbs at certain frequencies, whether it emits at certain frequencies, tells you what the elemental composition is. Do we have any further questions? Thank you so much, Emily. Thanks, guys.